Happy Monday morning, everybody. I'm outside again. I am, I don't know if I'm COVID free, but I should be not COVID contagious. Feeling a lot better. I don't think I'll be coughing on you, but the wind is up. So that's a good thing. We're back outside the beautiful clouds, beautiful spring, spring, summer day, like a Minnesota summer day, 70s. It's beautiful out. It's a great way to start the week. And we're starting it off right in God's word together. Um, in God's word and prayer, and that's the way we got to do it. Um, today, as we're starting off in our devotion, um, just a, a little history of mine is, is I grew up um, a good portion of my childhood in New Hampshire. If you knew that, many of you probably did, but maybe you didn't know that. And the thing that was, many things were interesting about that, but one thing that was interesting is like all my cousins and aunts and uncles and grandparents we're in Minnesota and Wisconsin while we were out there. Uh, my uh, dad's parents were in Wisconsin near Madison, and uh, then my mom's parents and all her siblings uh, were kind of in middle Minnesota, south central Minnesota, um, kind of the Wilmer area, Kirk, Vinson, um, different towns around there. And they moved around as they changed jobs and that sort of thing. And so um, when we were coming, we would drive all the way across the top of the United States um, and uh, go visit them. And we'd stop by in Wisconsin first and visit my uh, dad's side. And then we'd keep going and go into Minnesota and visit them. And, and uh, because we were the ones that traveled, we weren't the ones that were around each other you know, all the time. It was kind of a special thing when we got to be over there and we'd come for special occasions and holidays when we could, but we would often miss holidays. In fact, I remember one Christmas recording our present opening on cassette tapes to send them to Grandpa and Grandma Harvey so they could participate a little bit back before technology. Now we just FaceTime or something, right? The crazy different things that we used to do. And it's the separation that is, um, makes things hard. You know, I, while um, it was kind of fun to be special and, and when we came, uh, little special occasions would happen, everybody would try to get together to see everybody and, and it was a special time. What we missed was the day to day. What we missed is the growth and the funny things that happened. We'd have to try to catch up, but we'd miss so much of life because we were so far away. Today, we're gonna to be talking about something like that. We're gonna be talking about how um, uh, God's temple was. And uh, a brief recount, um, and uh, I'm not gonna read through all the texts, but here's what I would like to do. This is what I've been in devotion with um, for the last few days, is um, readings from 1 Kings chapter eight, chapters eight and nine. And then reading also from 2 Chronicles chapters 5, 6, and 7. And they kind of cover the same thing. If you don't know how the Bible um, kind of works or is laid out in that area, uh, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel uh, get into the start of the kings and, and Saul and, and uh, getting into uh, um, uh, the kingship of Israel and moving from judges to kings and that. And then you get into the kings, the books of kings, and, and you kind of... Uh, don't you get past David and into Solomon and the rest of the kings in both Israel and Judah. And uh, Chronicles uh, changes it a little bit. It, it focuses in a little bit more. It doesn't cover all the different things. It focuses in a little bit more, but it covers a lot of similar things. And um, so these two sections of scripture will cover very similar stuff. But if you read them, you notice a few different things that uh, are unique to each of them worth a read this week if you can. And the reason that this struck me as interesting is, is um, much like uh, me having to travel to see family, um, it also reminded me of those posts I see on Facebook of like, I don't have to go to church. I can worship God in my canoe or my tent or my trailer or whatever. Or I can worship God um, in my backyard. And that is completely true. I am not arguing that. But there's a reason why God chooses to gather his people. There's a very big, important reason. And we get to see this in this, this temple and this tabernacle. So quick, brief history. If you're not familiar, hopefully keep this nice and short here. Um, thousands of years, or hundreds of years of history here. Um, the tabernacle was created. It was a super fancy, elaborately constructed 
tent um, temple, a tent temple. And it had frames and, and bases to hold up the frames. And then on the frames, you'd put layers of cloth and leather. And so this was a significant, significant structure, but it was portable and it was a tent. And the people of Israel would um, tear it down and move it whenever God says to move, whenever the cloud would rise up into the air and, and show them that they were moving again. And uh, they would set it right back up um, every time they stopped to make camp. And so they may be staying in a place for a few days or a few months, but this very elaborate, very big tent had certain people to move everything. And um, it is how, how they uh, saw God present with them. God said, chose, God chose to be present with them. And so all the people of Israel were part of this, this moving community. That was the group. It wasn't like they had some over there, some over there. They were all traveling together. It grew and grew to be many, many thousands of people, even over millions of people. And they traveled together and God was in their midst. In the very center of a whole camp was this tabernacle. And when it post, it got posted up, then the, the cloud of the, the showed God's presence would descend upon it. And they knew that they were in the right spot. And at times Moses would go to talk to, to God and and uh, it was a way of life and to me it just blows my mind like if we had a small town or a large town of people and we set up this this tent every time we stopped and every time this cloud descended from the sky and showed god's presence you'd think that would never get old that would always be amazing but even that was <laughs> taken for granted quickly isn't it amazing how resilient human beings are well, as they headed to the promised land and Moses was leading them in, God said, when, we, when you get into that land, at, at the time I choose, I'm going to choose a place, and that is where I'm going to reside in this land. And, and you're not going to be gathered, everybody's not going to be tent camping around my one tabernacle, but you're going to have a temple at this one place, and you're going to spread out through this big land full of fields you did not plow, and bu buildings you did not build, and houses you did not make you're going to be spread out, but always gather for these festivals together at this place that I am going to choose. Well, Saul became, well, there was judges in the land, I should say. First, they entered the land, there was judges in the land, and then Saul became king. No temple, no place chosen. The tabernacle was still set up, and, and there were different high places that people would worship at, and, and sometimes those worshiping places would become idol worshiping places, and and uh, there was struggle, especially in the time of the judges and later in the time of kings. Saul, Saul came, no temple. David came and he wanted to build that temple so bad, but God said no. So David prepared and made agreements and got tons of stuff ready, so much valuable bronze and silver and gold and cedar and, and all this stuff. He got ready for the building of the temple, but he was not to build it. And then Solomon builds it. And if you read the chapters before the ones I referenced, so before 1 Kings 8 and before 2 Chronicles 5, you're going to hear the construction of the temple. If you like that stuff, it's very interesting. But in this section, we're talking about the temple, and it was built, and now it's time to take this temporary, movable tabernacle and the altar, oh, I should say the, the Ark of the Covenant, and they were going to move it and enter into the temple that was finished. Brand spanking new, beautiful, large, spacious, incredibly big building for the time. Incredibly impressive building. And they were going to take this moving tabernacle that was with the people and moved with the people and place it in this place that God had chosen to reside. And Solomon does it big. As you read in here, it talks about how as they're just traveling with the Ark of the Covenant, um, they're sacrificing as they go. And the priests and Levites carried it and they brought up and they, um, um, they, they sacrificed so many offerings on the way that it was, couldn't be counted or recorded. It was just so many animals of, of praise and, and fellowship and, and so many sacrifices were given they couldn't even record them. And that was just before they got to the temple. When they got to the temple and they put the ark uh, into the holy of holy places and the poles reached out a little further but you couldn't see from outside and and the ark was there and that was the place where God chose to be with the people he chose to be there 
and the cloud descended and the priests couldn't do their work anymore because the cloud descended again and was on the temple. And again, in this place, this brand new, huge building, God chose to be there and be with them. As it says here, and I'm in 1 Kings chapter 8, again, both places would have this. Um, in chapter 8, verse 10, when the priests withdrew from the holy place after they laid, put, placed the Ark of the Covenant there, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord, and the priests could not perform their services because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled his temple. It says that in Chronicles 2. And Solomon says, this is, this is a sign. This is what he said he would do. He would come in this dark cloud. And Solomon's pretty happy that his temple was a place pleasing to the Lord. But even Solomon then prays this long prayer. And this long prayer, one, it says, How can you reside here, God? You are so big, and my temple is beautiful, but it's not big enough for you. And then he goes into this long prayer, and he just lays out, just like Moses did in Deuteronomy and, and so many other places in Scripture, is he sees that humans are so resilient. The awe of the Lord sheds so quickly. And even though in this place in Jerusalem, they were going to see the, the pillar of cloud, the cloud descending, and God showing that he is present with his people, wouldn't it be awesome if, if every Sunday a cloud descended and we knew that God was present with us? We don't have that. You might say, that's not fair, but these people had it, and they gave, took it for granted. That is not what worship is all about. And through this dedication prayer, Solomon talks about all these ways these people could fall away and all the bad things that might happen. And um, then he says, whenever they look to this temple or they pray and they, they say, Lord, forgive us, please listen to them for the sake of this temple. Please listen to them. Please be here with us. Now, after, I mean, during this time, all the elders and people gathered in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was just plumb full of people as this dedication happened. And after 14 days of dedication, a little extra time, then Solomon sent them all home. Some of them went across the river because some of the tribes settled across the river. Some of the rest of them went off to different corners of this great landmass, far away from the temple. Far away from the temple. And what happened? struggles and the further away they were from the temple the more struggles there were as they wanted to worship something closer they didn't want to take time to go to the temple and they might have said kind of what we say sometimes i don't need to go to the temple i can do that here and god did allow them to do some of that stuff away from the temple at certain times but at certain times they're supposed to go to the temple to be united as one people to be present with god when they did that, good things happened. And when they didn't do it, they started forgetting. They started missing out on life. That's the way it is for human beings when we're away. When you're away from family, you start missing out and then forgetting. Oh shoot, that was that their birthday was the other day. Ah shoot. You start forgetting little things. And it's the same way when we decide we're gonna worship somewhere else, like in our house or or away at the cabin or or we're gonna we can worship if we're we're fishing or if we're on the shore or if we're at church or whatever and and god is with you god has interacted with us in a different way we no longer have to go to this temple to be with god of course jesus is with you always but the the fact remains the temple was not there for god the temple was not there for god the temple was there for the people god back then could do exactly what God does today and, and meet each person where they are. He is that big. But he knew that they needed to get together. And he knew that they needed to share these experiences. He knew that they would they would fall away without that common place. The people that saw the cloud descend on the temple regularly would would take it for granted and the people that were gone would come back and go that's what i remember that's special and then the people that saw it all the time and took it for granted would say ah that's right we need each other and we need to be present and that's what church is about that's what the temple was about it's not for god 
he doesn't need his ego stroked. <laughs> he doesn't need us to come and give him a certain amount of worship or, or praise to make his battery charge up. He is good all the time. What God wants from us is for us to be fed. Worship is about him coming to us and blessing us. And it's amazing, amazing how he blesses us through worship. As I was looking um, through here, I'm going to kind of move to, and we got to go through his prayer. In Chronicles, Second Chronicles, um, it ends with a very a dramatic, dramatic picture that isn't in Kings. And who knows what this looked like and how this was interpreted. I take it at face value because it's in the Bible and, and I mean, I can't argue against it. Let's just go with it, right? In uh, Second Chronicles 7, um, when Solomon finishes this big prayer, and this isn't recorded in Kings, but it's in Chronicles, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offerings. We're starting at 7.1 in Second Chronicles. Consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of God above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground, and they worshipped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, He is good. His love endures forever. I love that because so many places that that was going to happen in Scripture, they were terrified. But here they go down, and it was happening at the temple where they expected it, and they say, He is good. His love endures endures forever. God is good. His love endures forever. Let us not neglect coming together, coming together physically in this place of church and saying together, His love endures forever. He is good. And helping each other, each of us, remind each other just what's, what special great things is hap are happening at church when we're together worshiping God and what he is doing for us. Now these days of live stream and all that type of stuff, we are, I am not taking anything away from that. If that is what you're doing and that's what you have to do, that is it. But, but I encourage you um, to keep coming together. Live stream is one good step. Devotions online like these are one good step, but it's so good to be together in one place receiving the blessings of God as he calls us together, not for his sake, not for his ego or, or so that he feels not lonely, but for us, because we need that. You need that. I need that. We need this, and God provides it. He is good. His love endures forever. Take a look at... Um, uh, 1 Kings 8 and 9 and 2 Chronicles 5 through 7. Take a peek at that. You're going to see some amazing things. It's an awesome prayer Solomon shares. And it's just, uh, it's worth a read. A few more chapters this week, but it won't hurt you one bit. And you'll find something new. And that's always great. Um, but for today, let's close with a word of prayer. Ah, what a beautiful day. What a beautiful summer. What a great way to start our week in God's word together. Let's pray. Uh, Lord Jesus Christ, we praise you and thank you for your great love for us, Lord. Thank you for drawing us to yourself. And you don't draw us to yourself because of something that you need or you want from us or you desire or demand from us, Lord. You draw us together because we need to be together. Lord, we thank you for times of rest where we can get to those campers and those cabins, get on the lake and fish. We can enjoy your creation and worship you and praise you in that creation, Lord. And then bring us back. Bring us back to be present with each other, to share your love with each other, to encourage each other and get ready to go out and spread the news. Be that echo from you to the world. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. It's time to start this week together. We've started in God's Word. Now let's, let's get out there and continue in God's Word, continue in this week. And have a great one. I'll see you next Monday. Blessings to you all.